Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for coming to the conference or inquiry celebrating reason. My name is Shauna Watson and I'm Vice President of CFI Canada. Really excited to welcome Michael, Michael Wong, um, who I know because my students uh, um, have one of his articles as a, as a required reading. And uh, their assignment is to um, use the Feynman technique uh, to explain what Michael is saying in this article uh, to six-year-olds. So they love that assignment and they always tell me they love uh, uh, what, what Michael has said in this. Um, so I got tuned into Michael through that article and I learned that he has an amazing podcast on Star Trek, which I started to listen to. Specifically, I then found out that Michael is a research associate, associate in the University of Washington's astrobiology program. He studies planetary atmosphere, habitability, biosignatures, and the emergence of life. Wow. In my, uh, in my mind, uh, Michael is a, <laughs> is a rock star. All the things I wish I could do. <laughs> Over to you, Michael. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction, Gus. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here as a part of this incredible conference. I've really enjoyed the time I've spent uh, in the Zoom call with you all so far. Uh, really enjoyed the previous speakers and discussions and panels. Um, it's so it's so exciting to be here. Um, so let me go ahead and share my slides um, about the science of Star Trek. Yeah. And thanks again for this amazing opportunity and the invitation to speak on this topic that I love so much. So you may have all heard of something called Faraday's Law of Induction. You may even remember playing around with it in science class. Generally, it's demonstrated with a coil of wire and a magnet, and you pass the magnet through the wire, and the changing magnetic fields induces an, an, an electric current in the wire. And when this was discovered, it helped us unite the forces of electricity and magnetism into something that we now know and love as electromagnetism. Now imagine, imagine that you could somehow unite the forces of electromagnetism with the force of gravity. And as Einstein told us, gravity is nothing more than the bending and rippling of space-time. So what if you could have an electromagnetic energy source so powerful that you could literally warp the space around you, expand it behind you, contract it in front of you through the power of science, plus a little sprinkling of imagination, you will have created a tidal wave of space time that you could travel faster than the speed of light. What would you do with such a marvelous engine? I think I know. I think you'd venture out into space, the final frontier. Explore strange new worlds. Seek out new life and new civilizations. Boldly find yourself under a pile of tribbles. <laughs> You'd be an explorer, going where no one has gone before, and all the while making new friends, sharing fond memories, and learning what it means to be human. This was the vision of a man named Gene Roddenberry, who in 1964 wrote a proposal to NBC Studios for the creation of a brand new television show that he called Star Trek. Now, ever since Star Trek's inception, Gene Roddenberry knew that he wanted science to be at its core. 
So much so that in this 1964 proposal, Gene Roddenberry wrote about an equation penned just a few years earlier by astrophysicist Frank Drake. Now, this is what Drake's equation looks like. It's meant to help us organize our knowledge and our ignorance about the cosmos in an attempt to estimate the number of intelligent transmitting civilizations in the galaxy. Thing is, back in 1964, you couldn't just Google Drake's equation. In fact, Gene Roddenberry had no idea what Drake's equation actually looked like. So under the pressure of the studio to submit his proposal on time, he simply scribbled something random onto a piece of paper and sent it in. Now, luckily for us, the studio also had no idea what Drake's equation actually looked like and Star Trek was approved. Now, many years later, Professor Drake was actually invited aboard Star Trek to scientifically advise one of the episodes. And when he was in the studio, he was shown this fictitious version of his equation that Gene Roddenberry had penned in his name. And when he saw this equation, he just laughed. He said, oh, Gene, don't you know that raising something to the first power is simply itself? Like, why would you do that? <laughs> so this is what Drake's equation actually says in all of its detail. Again, it's trying to estimate the number of intelligent transmitting civilizations in our galaxy. Now, unfortunately, today, we don't have time to go through each and every one of the terms in this equation. But suffice it to say that the final four terms, those shown here in red, are really difficult to estimate. They deal with things like the probability of the emergence of life and the lifetimes of transmitting civilizations. These are things that we still really don't know what they are today. But the first three numbers, those shown here in blue, are astrophysical quantities. These are numbers that we can try to observe in the universe using telescopic technology today. So if you take just those first three numbers and you multiply them through, you get the number of Earth-like planets in the galaxy. That's simply the number of stars in the galaxy, multiplied by the fraction of those stars with planets, multiplied by the number of Earth-like planets per planetary system. Now, Gene Roddenberry actually had no idea what this number was either. Back in the 60s, there was just no way for him to know. But Gene Roddenberry did know that whatever this number was going to be, it was going to be huge, right? Because the number of stars in our galaxy is literally astronomical. So when you discover what this number is today, you have a choice. You have a choice about how you are going to feel about this number. Are you going to feel small because you're just one insignificant living being on a tiny mote of dust floating in a vast cosmic void? Or are you going to feel large because you are a part of this grand evolving universe of ours and special because despite what might be out there, despite all of those possibilities, there's just one and only one of you. Now, this was the kind of mathematical philosophizing that Dr. Leonard McCoy brought to his captain, Captain James T. Kirk, in an episode of classic Star Trek called Balance of Terror. In this episode, Captain Kirk is pitted against an equally formidable Romulan captain, and Captain Kirk is feeling the draining weight of Starship Command. He's second-guessing his every move. He just wants a vacation. So Dr. McCoy comes to Captain Kirk to spring his captain back into action. And he does so by prescribing a very peculiar, though very potent medicine, the mathematical probabilities of the universe. I think we should take a look at that scene. I'm going to quickly stop sharing and reshare because I don't believe I clicked the share sound button and I wanna make sure you can hear this. All right, there we go. Resharing with the share sound, okay. 
I wish I were on a long sea voyage somewhere. Not too much deck tennis, no frantic dancing, and no responsibility. Why me? I look around that bridge. And I see the men waiting for me to make the next move. Some bones. What if I'm wrong? Captain, no. I don't really expect an answer. But I've got one. Something I seldom say to a customer, Jim. In this galaxy, there's a mathematical probability of three million Earth-type planets. And in all of the universe, three million million galaxies like this. And in all of that, and perhaps more, only one of each of us. Don't destroy the one named Kirk. All right, so that was part of Balance of Terror from the original Star Trek. Let's get back to our presentation now. Okay, so Dr. McCoy in this episode tells Captain Kirk that there are three million Earth-type planets in our galaxy. So let's see how right he was. Today we know that there are some 200 billion stars in the Milky Way. Now this isn't an exact number by any means, it's just an order of magnitude estimate, but it'll suffice for today. And thanks to the Kepler Space Telescope, humankind's greatest planet finding machine to date, and the TESS Telescope, which is Kepler's successor and will soon surpass Kepler's record of discovering exoplanets, we now know that the fraction of stars that have planets is basically one. That is to say that every single star that you see in the night sky on average has a planetary system going around it. And thanks to the hard work of astrophysicists around the globe, we now know that roughly 20% of those systems has an Earth-sized planet orbiting in that star's Goldilocks zone. And so if you multiply these three numbers together, you get something like 40 billion and remember, a billion is a thousand times more than a million. So Dr. McCoy was off in his estimate by a factor of over 10,000. Yikes. Well, we can forgive Bones. After all, as he would love to remind us, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not an astrophysicist. <laughs> but you know, 40 billion planets is but a drop of water in our cosmic ocean. Beyond our galaxy lies hundreds of billions of other galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars. And it doesn't even stop there. Some theories in physics postulate the possibility of other universes in a concept that we call the multiverse. Now, unfortunately, science has not granted us a way to know if those other universes are really out there, much less travel to them. But luckily for us, Star Trek isn't pure science, right? It's science fiction. So let us again tap into the power of the imagination. So when Star Trek Discovery, which came out in 2017, we find out that the multiverse is connected by the so-called mycelial network. And while warp drive is a fantastic way of getting around inside your own universe, only with a spore drive can ships like the USS Discovery visit other universes entirely. Now, this concept of the mycelial network is actually based on an analogy to real life mycorrhizal networks. These are networks of fungi that swarm across forest floors. In fact, the largest single living organism on earth may be the honey fungus in Oregon, which spans nearly nine square kilometers and weighs over 600 tons. But you've probably never noticed these mycorrhizal networks before on your forest hikes, and that's because they're hiding right beneath your feet. Although they're concealed from sight, they're integral to everything that we see in the forest. 
through interleaving their mycelia with the roots of trees, they couple individual trees together as if the trees were separate universes and the fungi were the interdimensional highways that connect them. But what are they highways for? Certainly not starships full of daring explorers, but instead nutrients and chemicals. It's now known that trees that are doing really well and producing an exuberant amount of carbon through photosynthesis can donate that excess carbon to ailing trees nearby through this mycorrhizal network. And plants that are coming under harm, say from pests, can actually signal other plants through the mycorrhizal network to raise their defenses. Thus, the my mycorrhizal network binds the forest together in a web of symbiotic relationships that were, until very recently, hidden from human eyes. Now, one of the pioneers of mycorrhizal science is a man named Paul Stamets, who's shown here, and the writers of Star Trek Discovery were so inspired by Mr. Stamets' work that they paid homage to him by naming one of their main characters on the show astromycologist Paul Stamets in his honor. Okay, from here on out, I'm going to get into a bit of spoiler territory for the first season of Star Trek Discovery. Now, the season came out three and a half years ago, so I'm not too, I don't feel too bad about, you know, spoiling it for you, but I thought I'd just warn you before we get into those spoilers, uh, just in case some of you haven't seen it yet and want to remain unspoiled. But hopefully I won't lose too many of you because the scientific discussion that we'll get out of the storyline is absolutely fascinating. Okay, so here we go. In the first season of Star Trek Discovery, the crew discovers a very, very curious life form I seem to, there we go, uh, with the unique ability to travel through the mycelial network, hopping from one universe to another. And the crew names this ripper, uh, this creature Ripper, thanks to its ferocious appearance. And they also notice that it bears an uncanny resemblance to the humble earthly tardigrade. Now, evil Captain Lorca captures the tardigrade-like ripper and tasks it with piloting the ship through the mycelial network. And exerted to exhaustion, ripper shrivels up into a state of cryptobiosis and leaves the crew without a way to hop back to their own universe. But the crew still needs a way to travel through the mycelial network, right? So the trio of cadet Sylvia Tilly, Lieutenant Paul Stamets, and specialist Michael Burnham figure out how Ripper was accessing the network. And they identify specific sequences of DNA inside of Ripper that allows it to access the network. And this DNA, once injected into Paul Stamets, lets him access the mycelial network as well, allowing him to serve as the ship's navigator through the network in lieu of Ripper. Okay. So here's what a real life tardigrade looks like under a microscope. We see it crawling around amongst the forest of algae. It's a tiny, tiny animal, about one millimeter in size. And as you can see, it's practically the cutest thing ever. Like you never dream of naming this thing Ripper. Instead, tardigrades have garnered the nicknames water bears and moss piglets. So let's compare Ripper from Star Trek Discovery and real life tardigrades. Now, you may have been thinking to yourself as I was describing that plot line, what a bunch of baloney, right? Who, who thought of that? The tardigrade was a mycelial network traveler that entered a state of cryptobiosis when overworked and whose DNA you could pluck out of itself and transfer to a human to confer new abilities on that human. So does any of this actually check out? Well, as for being a mycelial network traveler, the answer is no. <laughs> There's no such thing as the mycelial network. Remember, it's just a sci-fi concept loosely based on analogy to the mycorrhizal networks of forests. But when it comes to cryptobiosis, the answer is actually yes. Tardigrades do indeed perform cryptobiosis and are what we call extremotolerant organisms. And that means basically they can survive very harrowing conditions. 
And perhaps more surprisingly, actually, yes, humans can borrow DNA from tardigrades and learn new tricks from our microscopic counterparts. Okay, so let's talk about extremo tolerance. Tardigrades do in fact perform cryptobiosis, basically when they shrivel up into a dormant state and suspend their entire metabolism. And this occurs whenever tardigrades encounter extremely stressful conditions, and they can be of many different flavors, maybe extremely hot conditions, extremely toxic, uh, ones that lack oxygen or water. Basically, whenever the environment turns its back on a tardigrade, the tardigrade can turn its back on the environment in turn. Until, of course, conditions turn back to normal, when the tardigrade will soak up ambient water, reanimate itself, and continue all of its previous living functions. Tardigrades have been observed to maintain cryptobiosis for years, even decades. This is a truly amazing ability and honestly kind of makes me jealous because I wish I had this during the COVID-19 pandemic. Another speciality of tardigrades is radiation resistance. Now to understand this, let me remind you of a little bit of molecular biology. So remember that the instructions or the information that makes us who we are is written in molecules of DNA. And this information is coding essentially for the creation of proteins of various shapes and sizes and forms. And these proteins perform functions that make us who we are or make a tardigrade who it is. But if a bolt of radiation, say of ultraviolet light, strikes your DNA, there's a good chance that it will cause a harmful mutation. And even just one single mutation can throw off an entire protein and cause catastrophic damage to a living system. So that's why it's super important to protect your DNA. And that's why we wear things like sunscreen and hats when we go outside. Now, Tardigrades have a kind of built-in sunscreen, uh, what is called the DSUP protein or the damage su suppressor protein. And it fits kind of snug like a sock around DNA and protects it from gaining any radiation blisters. All right, so here is a real figure from a scientific paper that came out just last year. So this is hot off the press, cutting edge science. This paper analyzed the atomic and molecular structure of the DSUP protein. On the left side, you see a side view where the DSUP protein wraps around a strand of DNA, which is shown in red. And on the right side, you see a top-down view of the same thing, where you can clearly see the DSUP protein enveloping the DNA on all sides, protecting it from harm. Now, furthermore, this figure is color-coded by the electric charge of the molecule. So red is negatively charged and blue is positively charged. And the analysis in this study showed that the DSUP protein essentially clings to molecules of DNA through electrostatic interactions, similar to how your hair would stick to a balloon that you've rubbed on the carpet. It's as simple as opposites attract. And this is really important because it turns out that all DNA molecules are negatively charged thanks to the phosphate ion that lines their backbones. And this means that DSUP should be able to shield not just tardigrade DNA, but DNA in any life form on Earth. If only that life form knew how to make it. So recently, scientists have been taking tardigrade DNA and introducing it to human cells. Once inside of our cell, our cell's machinery will read this tardigrade DNA and produce the DSUP protein, which will go and envelop human DNA, protecting that DNA from radiation damage. Now in experiments, human cells with tardigrade DSUP DNA are able to survive otherwise lethal blasts of X-ray radiation and hydrogen peroxide. So what is this technology useful for? Well, perhaps enabling longer duration space missions. In space, radiation levels are a lot worse than they are here on the surface of the Earth. So equipping, say, our crops with DSEP proteins may help food sources survive and grow better in outer space. 
And although lab experiments have only introduced DCEP DNA to single human cells so far, maybe one day tardigrade DNA will grant real astronauts greater access to the universe in a striking parallel to how Ripper's DNA granted Lieutenant Stamets unfettered access to the mycelial network. Now, of course, tampering with the human genome <laughs> invites a constellation of ethical dilemmas. Luckily, Star Trek has myriad episodes and movies examining all facets of genetic engineering from their potential to cure diseases, to the conundrum of designer babies, to the risk of creating a genetically enhanced superhuman bent on conquering the galaxy. Now, Unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss all of these stories tonight, but I encourage you to use these Star Trek episodes to spark some personal introspection about the technology of genetic engineering. Because what was only a thought experiment for 1960s sci-fi writers is quickly becoming a reality today. This century, scientists and policymakers must wrestle with questions like, will access to gene therapy be equitable and just? Where exactly is the line between treatments and cosmetics? And who gets to decide what quote unquote defects need quote unquote fixing? Again, the beautiful thing about Star Trek is that it makes us ask these tough questions about our scientific breakthroughs. So let me end by highlighting another big idea from our journey today. It's a theme that is central to both Star Trek and science, and one that's especially important to remember during this COVID-19 pandemic. And that theme is interconnectedness. We see interconnectedness on every level of existence, such as the interpersonal level, right? It took the entire crew of the discovery working together to solve the mystery of Ripper and understand the scientific basis for mycelial network travel. Similarly, in real life, it takes huge teams of scientists working together to make incredible discoveries about our universe, whether it's the number of potentially habitable exoplanets in our galaxy or the nanoscopic nature of a protein that protects our DNA from harm. On the ecosystem level, we are connected to the life around us, even if we seem like separate independent entities. This connection can obviously be very subtle and hidden like the mycorrhizal networks that help trees negotiate trades and keep forests healthy. But remember that these trees supply us with the oxygen we need to breathe as well. So in a way, we owe our existence to our friendly neighborhood fungi. And finally, on the biosphere level, you know, some of us speak English, some of us speak French, some speak Spanish, or Hindi, or Malay, but we all speak DNA, a simple four-letter language that is billions of years old. And we share this language with every living thing on Earth. We are all united by our biochemistry. And the fact that our bodies know how to read tardigrade DNA <laughs> it's absolutely mind-blowing, right? And this further reinforces my belief that when we trek to the stars, we do so not as Canadians or Americans or Chinese or Russians, or not even solely as human beings, but we do so as earthlings, representing this wondrous, diverse, and majestic pale blue dot that we call home. All right, before I take your questions, which I will be absolutely happy to, I just wanna mention that Star Trek Discovery is going strong. Uh, it just had its third season and its fourth season is filming currently, uh, I believe actually up in Toronto, um, perhaps close to where some of you are. 
Uh, so uh, I didn't have time to talk about a lot of the science in Star Trek, including some of the later seasons of Star Trek Discovery, uh, for the later seasons of Star Trek Discovery, mainly because I don't want to spoil it for anybody who uh, wants to see those but hasn't had the chance yet. But if you'd like to learn about the science in all of the renditions of Star Trek, I encourage you to check out my podcast, which Gus mentioned at the top. It's called Strange New Worlds, a science in Star Trek podcast. And you can also find me on Twitter, where I tweet mostly about scientific and Star Trek things. Uh, and with that, I will happily take any questions that you may have. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. I, I, my, my inner geek is just uh, really enjoying this. Um, but, uh, um, and I've posted the uh, link to your podcast, uh, to Michael's podcast in, in, the, uh, um, in the chat. Uh, I have a few questions. If you have more questions, please uh, um, send them in, in the chat. And uh, so the first question is um, about the Drake equation. And if you can comment on, on um, what the, uh, the Goldilocks effect, the Goldilocks parameters have to do with the Drake equation. Oh, fantastic question. Yes. Uh, in a longer version of this talk, I actually uh, do go into that in quite a bit of detail. But um, for this uh, shortened 30 minute version of it, I, I was an, unable to get to it. But I'm glad the question came because now I can talk about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so the Goldilocks zone is um, essentially the region around a star where liquid water can exist on a Earth-like planet under an Earth-like atmosphere. And uh, this generally is thought of as sort of this annulus or ring around the star, too close or too hot, too far, or too cold, and the water will either boil or freeze, as has happened in our solar system on, on the examples of Venus uh, and on Mars, right? So we seem to be orbiting in this Goldilocks zone for our system. And the planets that we want to go after first when we look for our extraterrestrial life will be those in the Goldilocks zone. Now, to be absolutely clear, the Goldilocks zone does not guarantee that you will be habitable. So you could be in the Goldilocks zone, but be the completely wrong type of planet, right? Or you could be outside of the Goldilocks zone and still be habitable because you are gaining your heat from a source other than the sun. And this actually occurs for some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. Out there in the outer reaches of our solar system, their surfaces are frozen. So I'm, I'm mainly talking about Europa or Enceladus for those of you who want to uh, look those moons up. So the surface of Europa and Enceladus are completely frozen over, but they gain heat through tidal forces. That means they have a global liquid water ocean underneath those icy crusts. And we think those oceans could be habitable too, despite being far outside the Goldilocks zone. So when searching for life, we definitely wanna focus on the Goldilocks zone because that is a, the most likely place where we will find life like us that we'll be able to recognize easily. But there are still other environments out there too that we want to focus on uh, that are outside the Goldilocks zone. Hope that answered your question. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next question. Um, now that we're visiting Mars and other planets, um, and, and obviously with, with our robots, not with humans yet, are we doing enough not to inadvertently contaminate them with human life or with, with Earth life? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Yes, uh, indeed, this is a big conundrum, both scientifically and philosophically. Uh, so NASA has a Planetary Protection Office, uh, that's what they call it. Uh, and the idea is both to keep us from spreading life on Earth to life on other worlds, and also to keep back contamination from occurring that might be potentially devastating. So, in or to answer your question, yes, we are worried about that. But so far, we have not yet traveled to a location that is deemed habitable for Earth life. That is, the rovers that we send to Mars are just going around ancient, what, what, what used to be habitable locations, but have since long dried up uh, and any life that would be there has, has essentially either been fossilized or lost to time. So we're looking for essentially fossilized life on Mars with our rovers. We don't think that even if there was some kind of life on that rover, and there almost certainly is because bacteria are everywhere, that they would 
thrive in such an environment. But I think where this uh, really needs to be taken into account is when we go and sample, say, things from Europa or Enceladus, those icy moons that I was talking about, where there is plentiful liquid water in those locations. And if we drill down into those oceans, we really need to be careful not to be bringing Earth life, number one, because we don't want to accidentally find it <laughs> and then declare we found life. But really, it was stuff that we brought along. That would be really embarrassing. And we also don't want to essentially introduce um, something that could disturb or potentially even destroy an ecosystem that is living there um, for ethical reasons. So yes, um, great question. Thanks, Michael. Um, here's, here's a geeky question. Um, um, so uh, um, Sean Manning points out that there's a Mike Wong who's an engineer and humanist in Canada who loves Star Wars. And, uh, and um, uh, Sean says, neither Mike Wong appears to have a goatee. Which of you is from the Federation universe and which is from the mirror, mirror universe? <laughs> I love that question. That is fantastic. I've never heard that question phrased that way before, although I have had a question about this Mike Wong, uh, who is very much a Star Wars fan, uh, and I, I believe sometimes speaks ill of Star Trek. I, I like Star Wars. I'm actually not one of those fans who, um, you know, takes one side or the other. I happen to love both of them. Maybe I love Star Trek a little bit more. And honestly, probably because Star Trek has so much real science in it. It's so inspiring to people who want to pursue science. Uh, and it's great because I can actually talk about the science in Star Trek. It would be really hard for me actually to talk too much about the science in Star Wars. Um, so maybe that is actually the tiebreaker for me. But, um, but in terms of the other Mike Wong, I have not yet met him. I don't think it would be a universe ending event if we did. Uh, the more problematic thing for me actually is that there is another Mike Wong in planetary science, my field of study. And we get confused with one another all the time. Uh, sometimes we'll be at conferences and uh, the, the, the person at the, uh, the hotel registration will be like, you know, you booked two rooms for yourself. Why did you do that? And I'll be like, oh no, it's just the other Mike Wong. He's here too. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, that's the one that gives me more trouble. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay, so, so um, ne next question. Um, are, have, have we become too jaded to, to science since the 1960s so that we are not inspired by real science for science fiction the way we were 50 years ago? Uh, well, it's hard for me to answer that because I wasn't around in the 1960s, so I'm not really sure what it was like to live through that time. But I would guess that the answer is no. I, I, I'm surrounded by people, you know, graduate students, research, young researchers, early career scientists like myself, who were inspired by science fiction, whether it was Star Trek or Star Wars or something else. Lots of people love the show The Expanse right now. I hear, I hear it's a great book series as well. Um, I don't think that, uh, that, that the symbiotic relationship between science and science fiction will ever die out because one fuels the other. Uh, the science that we discover goes into those shows, makes them even better, inspires the next generation of scientists Again and again, it's it's a it's a positive feedback loop, um, and so maybe there is maybe things have changed in some ways, uh, but I I don't see it in my life that uh, people are are no longer inspired by it. Yeah. Thanks. Um, what what's the latest stance on the definition of life? How do we decide how to look for life on other planets? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I actually wrote a paper last year about revising the definition of life. Uh, it's an open access paper, uh, purposely done so. Uh, I'll just actually throw the throw the link to it in the chat. Um, so open access basically means there's no paywall. Anybody can access it in the world. Um, so if you want to to read the uh, the paper, there it is. I also did several. Um, 
you know, popular science articles about it and other and science reporters have written about this definition as well. Uh, and so, um, you know, you can find those out there if you don't want to get into the nitty gritty details of, of an actual scientific paper. But, um, but this idea is essentially that we need two words for, for discussing what we're talking about when we're looking for life out there. Uh, one I've defined as life with an I, spelled as we all spell it, L-I-F-E. And then a new word, life with a Y, L-Y-F-E. And the idea is that L-Y-F-E, life with a Y, is the most general definition of life you could possibly imagine. It has no bearing whatsoever on the material that that life is made out of, the chemistry, the DNA, anything specific but just is based on four principles. If any system does four processes, we would deem it a living system. And that is dissipation, which is a fancy term for energy conversion. We all need to eat and breathe, for instance, um, but not necessarily the same thing, right? Uh, and uh, uh, autocatalysis, that's essentially exponential growth and proliferation. Um, homeostasis, maintaining ourselves um, despite the perturbations of random events in our environment. And finally, learning, which uh, evolution is a huge part of. Now, uh, you, the reason why I want there to be a general term and a specific term for life exactly as we know it is because those are two different questions that we ask about the universe. Is there life out there exactly like us? That's one question. Is there life out there in its most general sense? That's a separate question. And I think people need two words and two definitions to keep those questions straight because like you said, the definition of life really impacts how we go about searching for it. And the strategies for searching for life as we know it and life as we don't know it are very different. So I encourage you to read the papers and, uh, and, the, and the follow up uh, things. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for that question. That, that's an excellent point. Thanks. Um, OK, so um, I have I have one final question. And it's a question that I have shamelessly stolen from a podcast. As okay. we're well into our second year living with a global pandemic, what is something that makes you hopeful? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, I love that. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I ask all of my um, all of my guests on Strange New Worlds that uh, question at the very end of my podcast, um, and and I've gotten so many varying answers that just fill me with hope um, in these in these you know tr dark, troubling, and uh, frankly very stressful and sad times. Uh, and I think the thing that that gives me hope is that there are gatherings of of, of minds, of intellects, and of people like this. You know, this conference is going on right now, uh, despite all of the, the, the trouble that COVID has caused us. At the same time, scientific conferences continue to go and continue to flourish, and we continue to, um, you know, converse with one another and share ideas and generate new ideas, despite being separated by, you know, whether it's six feet or 6,000 miles. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's amazing to me that uh, we are able to continue to stay in touch through our little aluminum boxes. Um, and the feeling of being able to inspire other people to make them laugh or to just get them to ask a new question uh, despite all of what we're going, what's going on right now uh, does fill me with hope for the future of humanity. Um, and, and hearing all of your great questions come back at me, knowing that I've, you know, made an imprint and that I've piqued some curiosity in you all uh, is just so rewarding and fulfilling. So thank you very much. Thank you again, Michael, and thank you for, to everyone for uh, um, great questions and coming to the talk. And maybe we'll have a chance to uh, chat further at some of our social events later.